a, a PowerPoint uh, in a moment, which basically just consists of photographs. Um, so I thought I'd talk for about half an hour or so, um, kind of to the images, which really chart the life of Regina Twala, the woman I'm writing about. Um, and then perhaps we could have, you know, questions dealing with the chapters that I circulated. So, um, uh, can everyone see that? Great. Uh, Stephen, you'll stop me if I go on, but I remember you said kind of 30, 40 minutes is, yeah. is kind of what you yeah. expect. So that, I'll aim more for 30. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so as you've hopefully seen from the pre-circulated paper, um, really the title of, of my book, that's the um, title that I've given to the presentation, is written out the life and work of Regina Galana Twala, uh, who's this lady here, who was born in 1908 and died in 1968. So I think the book really begins with a question, which is, um, why have none of us heard of Regina Galana Twala? Um, and it might be that I'm going to receive a happy surprise and find out that some people know exactly who she is. But my sense is that if you do, you're very much in the minority um, and that she is a woman and an intellectual figure um, of whom historians of Southern Africa are largely, if not entirely unaware, that her name has been preserved really within the small confines of her family circle and the ever dwindling number of people who still remember her um, from her own lifetime, but who of course rapidly passing on due to the fact that she died um, more than 50 years ago. So the main argument that the book makes is that this is not a coincidental state of affairs, um, that there are specific structural reasons why we remember certain intellectual figures and why we forget others and why their names are consigned to obscurity. So the book makes the argument that rather than merely just being unknown by a product of chance, there was a more or less purposeful strategy whereby Regina Twala's legacy was written out posthumously, as well as during her life, she struggled to find places to write and to publish. Um, this can immediately be qualified. Uh, one of the chapters that I sent you deals with her literary production for a newspaper in Eswatini. And indeed she did write prolifically as a journalist throughout her life. But the thing that perpetually eluded her even beyond the grave was her effort to release her own literary work in published book form and to solidify a lifelong legacy in that way. So my book argues that a whole cast of characters conspired to write her out. Um, territorial European academics, about whom I'll say more when I come to the chapter about Bank Sinclair. Uh, in their number, we can also count Hilda Cooper, the anthropologist of Eswatini. Male politicians in both Eswatini and South Africa. So one of the things, uh, a chapter that I circulated to you deals with is her initially warm relationship with Sabuza, the monarch of Eswatini, Sabuza II, and then her eventual falling out with him. Jealous contemporary writers, almost entirely men. So an earlier chapter that I haven't circulated deals with the way in which her efforts to break into the literary scene in KwaZulu-Natal in the 1930s was stymied um, by the competitive territorialism of famed writers such as the Dlomo brothers. So taken as a whole, the book is arguing that we should look at fame when it comes to authorship and literary output as a highly contingent historical phenomenon. The reason why certain figures achieve fame and certain don't is a product of a complex set of circumstances, which includes but is not limited to both their gender and their race. So what I'm going to do today is give you a brief overview uh, that gives you some sense of the contours of Regina Twala's life, focusing in particular on key moments of literary output. Um, and then for the last 10 minutes, I'm going to focus a bit more on one of the chapters that I sent to you for circulation, where I talk about her work as a research assistant for the Swedish academic Bengt Sunkler and the way in which her research was plagiarized, stolen and passed off as his own. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, Regina Tolo was born in 1908 um, in Indaleni Mission Station, which is near Richmond in today KwaZulu-Natal. This is the only surviving photograph of her as a baby. Um, I should just say that almost all of these photographs are taken from the personal papers of Tim Cousins, who worked extensively with Regina's second husband, Dan Twala, uh, and had hoped to write something um, both on Dan and on Regina. Um, that project never came to pass, but in Tim's personal papers are a great many letters and photographs uh, that were lent to him by Dan Twala. And I'm grateful to Diana Wall, uh, Tim's partner, for allowing me access to this material. And of course, to the Twala family for their continued support of the project. So this is Regina as a baby in Indalani. She grew up on a, on a Methodist Christian mission station. Uh, her as a young girl of around um, 12 and 13. She was raised by her mother and her grandmother. Her mother worked as a domestic uh, worker in Durban. So she was effectively raised by her, her grandmother. Her father wasn't on the scene uh, as, a, as a young girl for both primary and later education. She attended the Indeleni Mission School, where she became very involved in wayfarers, who I'm sure many people here will recognize as the racially segregated um, girl guides movement that existed in South Africa. And you can see Regina in the top right hand um, of the photograph. She was also an ardent tennis pit player. Um, Indaleni Mission Station had excellent tennis courts and tennis remained one of her lifelong passions. You can see Regina on the left-hand side of the photograph um, holding her racket. Uh, and tennis actually would be what brought her to her second husband, Dan Twala. Um, after she graduated from Indaleni Mission School, she went to Adams College uh, where she embarked upon a teacher training qualification. And after completing that, she returned back to Indaleni Mission Station, where she took up uh, a position as an Isizulu teacher at the school. So a very conventional early life and upbringing in the sense that she was a more or less classic product of um, the kind of feminine ideal that was being produced and churned out by mission stations across South Africa in these decades. Um, she was intelligent, she was well-read, she was ambitious, she wanted to not only become a teacher, but she also had aspirations to write. Um, so from an early age, uh, probably around 1934 is the first evidence I found of her writing activities. Regina began submitting articles to Bantu World, then newly founded and an exciting periodical coming out of Johannesburg. And she made a career as a columnist, um, writing pithy commentaries, primarily on love, matters of the heart, relations between men and women, and imagining a new kind of basis for courtship and love that was urban, that was freed from the constraints of parental supervision. She also succeeded in winning a clutch of essay competitions. Um, and in general, I think the essay competition is a, is a really interesting and unstudied platform for literary expressions in the 1930s, that all of the major newspapers were regularly running competitions, cash prizes, as a means both to stimulate readership for their newspapers, but also to stimulate um, what they saw as the necessity to create African, African literature. So, and of course, her, her maiden name was um, Mazibuka, and here's a photograph of her. Um, in around 1936, Regina met the man who would become her first husband, uh, a man called Percy Kamalo, uh, photographed here. Um, she, she and Percy um, met through Indaleni Mission Station. He was connected to the same uh, KwaZulu Christian elite as she, she was from. His family were from Driefontaine, Edendale. They had a very quick courtship, um, married, and then she relocated to Johannesburg. He worked as a, as a mining clerk. Almost immediately, the marriage fell apart. Within several months, Regina discovered that he had um, a former partner with whom he had failed to break things off properly um, upon their marriage and that the relationship had continued. Percy was also, outside of his job as a mining clerk, he was a vaudeville dancer. And this position or occupation frequently took him away from the city at weekends, traveling as far away as Johannesburg, sorry, Cape Town. 
Um, and this seems to have also been an opportunity for, for him to pursue other relationships. So Regina, separated from him, decided that she actually wanted to divorce him, engaged the services of a, a white lawyer, H.M. Basner, um, whom some of you may um, recognize in connection with his role in the Communist Party in South Africa, and began the extremely laborious, nearly two-year-long two process of trying to gain her freedom, which as a married woman in 1930 South Africa, you can imagine was, was far from straightforward. And I'm happy to speak more about the sort of complexities of her divorce and indeed learn from people on this call, such as Natasha Alank, um, about the complexities of divorce. While she was going through the process of seeking her divorce, she quit her teaching job in Johannesburg and became a domestic worker for a, a white family in Houghton. Um, something that she, in later life, looked back upon as one of the lowest ebbs of her, of her life. Um, she was consumed by shame at the stigma of her impending divorce. Um, I imagine that it was difficult for her to find employment in a mission school in the city um, due to the divorce. And at that point, domestic work was really the only option that she felt she had open to her. It was while she was engaged as a domestic worker in Houghton that she started visiting um, the Bantu Sports Club, uh, which was in downtown Johannesburg, and the manager of which was the man pictured here, Dan Twala. Um, I won't say much about the sports club, just to say it was a, it was a landmark, it was an institution in 1930s Johannesburg, um, set up with the same white philanthropic funding that had supported the Bantu Men's Social Centre and part of the same conservative Christian project of moralizing leisure time, black leisure time in the city. Um, Ray Phillips, the American missionary, was, was a key figure behind it. And Dan Twala, uh, pictured here, was Ray Phillips' protege. Uh, a former footballer himself, uh, as well as a talented actor, as you'll shortly see, um, Dan Twala ran the sports club with energy for close on 25 years until it was defunded in the mid-1950s. And it was through visiting the sports club to use its tennis courts um, that Regina and Dan met and almost immediately fell in love. So Dan was also one of the founding members of the Bantu Dramatic Society. Um, this is Dan here on the left-hand side. And they put on a number of productions throughout the 1930s, working closely with Herbert Dlomo as well. Uh, this is Dan Twala in, in the cheerful nave, pictured here on the right-hand side. So Dan was extremely supportive of Regina's efforts to divorce. Um, and when it finally did come through in 1937, I think I'm right, um, either 37 or 38, uh, Dan and Regina married within days at the Johannesburg Magistrate Court. Um, this is a period of her life that I don't have many photographs of, so I'm just going to detail it very briefly. Um, it was also throughout these years of gaining her divorce from Percy and remarrying Dan that Regina was hard at work writing her first novel, a book called Gufa, um, so named after the main protagonist, a rural KwaZulu man who came to work in the mines at Johannesburg and had a kind of classic tale of downfall and corruption by the city. Um, one of the chapters of my book details her efforts to publish the manuscript, which included trying to get the sanction of the Zulu Cultural Society for it, and also the Natal Department of Education, um, which was then led by a figure called David Malcolm, um, or Daniel, David or Daniel Malcolm. Um, and that chapter shows how um, basically the, the almost entirely male Zulu literary elite of the period closed ranks against her. Um, and blocked publication of the book and refused, refused to authorize it um, to Malcolm and to the Department of Education uh, as, a, as a reading book for, for primary schools. Um, and Salbi M. Saman, who was a key figure in the Zulu Society and a former boyfriend of Regina's, had offered her his patronage for the book um, if she slept with him and she declined and the book was never published. Sadly, I only have one surviving fragment of this book, a couple of paragraphs, um, but it's something that she, she referred to a lot, particularly in later life. So it's, it's possible to reconstruct some sense of what it would have looked like. Um, this is Regina and Dan on holiday in Durban at the coast shortly after their marriage. Uh, and this is the first home that they lived in, uh, in Orlando, 7303 uh, Orlando East. 
This is actually Dan Twala's daughter um, from another marriage, uh, a woman called Mary Twala, who some of you may know as a famous actress who just passed away last year. Um, and before she died, I think it was in 2019, she showed me around their Orlando home. Um, disappointed at her failure to publish her first novel, Regina decided to retrain as a social worker. She was part of the pioneering year, year for the new Jan Hofmeyer School of Social Work, um, another initiative that Ray Phillips um, was a kind of key directing hand behind. Um, so in 1942, she graduated after the two-year training, part of the first cohort. She was quite disillusioned with um, the, the Hofmeyer School after her graduation. She felt that the brand of social work being pushed by Phillips and other missionaries um, was too conservative. She was also very academically talented. Um, and my research into the, the, the curriculum for the social school, um, the Hofmeyer School, shows that many, many hours were taken up with things like paper mache milk uh, making, um, tumbling, gymnastics, hygiene. There wasn't very much rigorous intellectual content, um, social theory, sociology, and so on. So it was partly for this reason that Regina uh, applied to and was accepted to do a BA degree at the University of the Vatis Rand, I'll return to that picture in a moment, um, starting in 1943 and eventually graduating in 1948 as the first black woman to ever graduate from the BA degree in social science um, and the second black woman to graduate from the university as a whole. I believe the first was a doctor in the medical school. So here she is in her graduating year in 1948. Um, part of the degree of social science, sciences at WITS, which was really designed to train um, social workers and reflected the growing interest across South African universities with professionalizing, standardizing um, the sort of hitherto quite erratic career of social work. Um, part of the, her training involved anthropology courses, um, and the person with whom she studied anthropology was none other than Hilda Cooper, um, who you can see here in a photograph from the 1930s, um, who was, as I'm sure many people know, a South African anthropologist who had worked extensively in then Swaziland in the 1930s. In this picture, the property of her daughter, Mary Cooper, she's pictured with uh, a young Sabuza. Uh, on the left-hand side. And it was under Hilda Cooper's direction and encouragement that um, Regina first started on the topic. Sorry, Joel. One second. No, it's okay. Sorry. Um, Ria? Sorry. There we go. Uh, okay, that sounds fine now. Yeah. Uh, started undertaking a number of field work trips uh, in Eswatini with the patronage and support, support of Sabuza himself, linked to the fact that her anthropology advisor at WITS uh, worked in Eswatini was also the fact that Regina's husband, Dan Toller, was himself a Lisweti um, from the kind of Mahamba Barberton area of the Eswatini border, uh, part of the very old prestigious Methodist elite um, of Mahamba mission. So Regina had this twofold link to Eswatini, both through her scholarship, through her, her burgeoning interest in anthropology, but also through marriage. Uh, and here's an Umtuteli Wabantu article, which celebrates her graduation uh, in 1945, and also shows her with her little son, Wusi, uh, who in this year, I think is about two years old, um, and whom she, she and Dan struggled for very many years, I think seven years to conceive. So his coming was really a source of great joy to her. Um, after her graduation from Witz, um, Regina became increasingly involved in politics. This was the late 1940s. Obviously it was the um, coming into power of the Nationalist Party, the beginning of apartheid proper. She became very involved in the defiance campaign, both in PE and in Johannesburg in the early 1950s, was arrested, spent some time in prison. And one of the chapters of my book deals in some depth with her growing um, political awakening. Um, and it's also in this period that Regina started using her, um, her second name, Gelana, rather than Regina, which I take to be a sign of her growing um, politicization and her refusal to use a European name. 
It was also in this period of her political involvement that her marriage with Dan Twala started falling apart. Uh, he, he was not particularly political himself. He felt that her political activities uh, were jeopardizing their home and their livelihood. He worried about his own position at the Bantu Sports Club if it was known that his wife was um, a key activist. In addition to that, there were also affairs. Um, so in the early 1950s, around 53, 54, Regina and Dan um, took the decision to separate, uh, although they never divorced, and Regina relocated to Eswatini under the auspices of a Nuffield Fellowship from the UK that was to fund about four years of her independent anthropological research into the state of Emaswati women at a time of culture change. So kind of a very classic ethnographic topic for that decade. Um, she had, even while in Joburg, really been very busily cultivating her links with Emaswati uh, royalty and elites. For example, she became, she, both she and Dan were members of an organization in Johannesburg called the Swazi Royal National Club. That was Sabuza's um, sort of outreach for both gathering taxes from Emaswati resident in Johannesburg, uh, as well as overseeing um, welcome receptions and so on during the many occasions when Sabuza went to Johannesburg to both visit his subjects and also just to have a good time. And, you know, I'm sure many of you have read Hugh McMillan and other people's work on Sabuza's immersion in intellectual networks of the 1930s and 40s, particularly those centered around anthropology. And of course here, his association with Hilda Cooper. So here you can see um, Regina seated there as part of the Swazi Royal Party for the Welcome Home Ian Smuts, General Smuts ceremony after the war. Um, key moments throughout the 40s and early 50s show her as the one who was handpicked to shepherd Sabuza's daughters and wives around the city when they came up to visit. So when she moved um, to Eswatini in the mid, early mid 1950s, she really had kind of solidified these key contexts and relationships and had an extremely warm personal relationship uh, with Sabuza himself. Her Nuffield funding, um, the, the direction which she took it was specifically a study on the beadwork of Emaswati women. Uh, Regina became a keen beadwork artist herself and wrote a number of articles on this topic, two of which have actually been published um, in the journal African Studies um, 51 and 52. It's also during this period in Eswatini, after her Nuffield funding ran out in the late 1950s, uh, that she began to work as an independent research assistant uh, for the Swedish academic Bengtsson Club, pictured here, who was the author of two pioneering books on independent churches in Southern Africa, the first Bantu Prophets in South Africa was written in 48, and then the second Zulu Zionists and Swazi Zionists came out in 76. Um, Sunkla was attached to the University of Natal's Institute for Social Research, which was where Hilda Cooper was at that time, because Hilda's husband, Leo Cooper, had a position at the University of Natal. And Regina was herself affiliated at the University of Natal um, as an independent researcher due to her connection with Hilda Cooper. So it would have seemed a natural link, a natural connection for Simpler to make contact with this you know, extremely impressive, talented researcher living in Eswatini, no doubt, I think, on the recommendation of Hilda Cooper. So as my chapter details, Regina started um, working as a as an assistant, and I say the word assistant with sort of huge scare quotes around it, because I think, um, you know, the notion of a research assistant is a very complex and I think problematic one. Um, really, I prefer to call her a research collaborator. Um, submitting to him copious notes of services attended, transcripts of hymns sung, even interviews, based on her immersion in Zionist churches in Eswatini throughout the late 1950s. And of course here, her links to the royal family were, were key. Um, and the fact that she was allowed easy open access to key gatherings, both of the Zionist church and of the royal family who had an extremely close symbiotic relationship. So the quality of the material she was able to submit to Sunkla was extremely, extremely rich, um, extremely detailed, extremely textured. Um, and you can see here just kind of a range of the kind of material she sent him. Um, the, and this kind of gets back into why I, I find the term assistant problematic, especially in this context. Uh, 
Um, my study of Re Regina's research materials that she sent to Simpler and then the published product of Simpler's book show an extensive reliance on Simpler's part upon Regina's writing um, to the extent that it can, you know, I think justly be described as plagiarism. So one example here um, is a research report sent by Regina to Simpler in July 1958, where she attends a meeting of the League of African Churches, which was the big federation overseeing Zionist churches in Swaziland in that period. Um, and I'll just read the, the text in the red box that I've highlighted. A bell was rung and that was the signal for all to find their staves and set up for Lobamba. Then when the women began singing, the congregation began marching in circles. The women with flags, Emma Gosa, always led the way. This parade before the church house is called Gutletla, same term as used for warriors or age groups when they dance or give a display before royalty. So compare this to what Sinclair wrote um, in the published book, Zulu Zionists and Swazi Zionists, which was only published in 1976, so many years later. Uh, and in red is what Twala sent to Simpler. This is what Simpler published nearly 20 years later. The bell was rung, the signal for all to find their holy sticks and to set up for Lobamba. The lady wardens and Magosa bore flags and led the way. The women with sticks while marching with walking circles. Gutlefa. This was the time used for warriors or age groups when giving a dancing display before royalty. So nearly, nearly a word for word um, reliance upon Regina's prose. And this is by no means the only part um, in this chapter where that happens. Um, this is another example I'll deal with more briefly where Regina was, and in fact, this is interesting because this material will crop up in a later article that Regina published um, in the Times of Swaziland. So this is where Regina is reporting to Sunkla on an important personality in the League, the Reverend Mokwanazi of Barberton, uh, who composes hymns for the Zionist churches. She points out that he's a jester, he usually comes with a bunch of handwritten copies, distributes around, conducts community singing. Needless to say, almost all the tunes have swing and good rhythm. Um, and then she also provides some of the hymns that have been written um, by Mokwanazi. Hymns sung at Sabia Sabas, very popular, the Mazdaini, the chorus comes first. And then this is how Sunkla um, used Regina's material. Um, I, I won't read it out, but I think you can sort of just get a sense, um, not only of the fact that he's, he's taken her prose, but he's even maintained the very order within which she submitted the hymns to him, um, including with her note about the following hymn has become very popular with Zionists. So, I mentioned that Regina, um, some of the material that she wrote for Sunkler, she also recycled. She put to work in her own writing projects uh, for her career as a columnist for the Times of Swaziland, where she wrote um, a great many of columns throughout the late 1950s and 1960s, really almost to within several years of her death for the Times of Swaziland. Um, and this is one example uh, called the Poet Laureate of the Swazi. She always wrote under a pseudonym, both for Johannesburg newspapers and Swati newspapers. Here she calls herself Intombazana, um, which is obviously kind of a young, a young girl, and invokes the pseudonym that she had used 30 years, 20 years earlier in Johannesburg, where she wrote for Bantu World, but then as Mademoiselle. Um, so a sort of lifelong interest in femininity, girlhood, female power, female autonomy, um, what it means to be a grown woman versus a young girl. And I think also by her choice to use a Zulu name at this point versus the French name of you know, several decades earlier, really echoing her shift from Regina to Galana as well in her choice of name, um, a growing rejection of European culture in favor of um, a more Afrocentric identity. So here, here and um, I won't read this out, but you can just see the, the bits of the text in red um, are more or less lifted directly from the research notes that she wrote to Simpler, um, you know, four years ago at this point. All right, so I think, Joel, it, Joel, can I give yeah. you five? Can I give you five? Yeah, five. sure. Yeah, I'm in my last few minutes, so, uh, my last few slides. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Simpler... Uh, did not acknowledge her uh, as one of his research assistants. So you can see here, he lists um, the main figures who did research for him. He says uh, five notebooks by African assistants. He names two of them, T.W.S. Mtembu and Peter Mkiza. 
um, and then some others, but Regina is, is completely unattributed, although in his introduction, and I'm grateful to one of the reviewers of my manuscript pointing this out, um, that in his introduction, he actually does mention her by name as someone who helped him with the project. But there's certainly nothing like any recognition of um, the very extensive work she did for him, nor the fact that he actually used her pose. Um, and then the next chapter that I submitted to you details her political career in Swaziland. And I think the key point about this chapter is it marks her growing estrangement from the conservative traditionalist politics of the royal family and of Sabuza himself and her increasing immersion in anti-colonial nationalist politics. She was a key figure in the SPP, the Swaziland Progressive Party, and then also in the Nangwane National Liberatory Congress, um, but also her growing alienation from Subuza himself and her rejection of the idea that the traditional status quo uh, was the best political settlement for Emma Swati after independence from Britain. She was sent to Ghana as part of a uh, National Ghanaian Liberatory Congress uh, delegation in the early 1960s. Here she is pictured in Ghana. Um, and I think this also points to the growing influence of Pan-Africanism in her thought. Here she is in the general strike of 1963 in Eswatini over there. And that gentleman there is TV Mtetwa who became the first um, police commissioner after independence in 68. So she died in 1968 um, prematurely from cancer, uh, is buried in the Manzini graveyard uh, in Eswatini. Just before I finish, I just want to kind of offer a brief coda, which is um, literally on her deathbed, she was trying yet again to publish another book. So this was a compilation of the nearly 100 or so articles that she'd written for the Times of Swaziland under the name in Tombazane for the last several years. Um, she approached um, Matt Sabula, who some of you may know as a key intellectual figure in Eswatini of the 1960s, as well as a close ally of Sabuza the King, asking whether <clears throat> he would propose her manuscript to Sabuza as an appropriate text to be published around the time of independence. This never happened. <clears throat> I assume that Sabuza didn't much like the idea of a, of a radical anti-monarchy politician's book. Um, being celebrated in 1968 and at independence. So then Matsubula actually forwarded the manuscript to Hilda Cooper, um, Regina's former mentor and teacher at Witz. Uh, Hilda Cooper, as some of you may know, had herself very close ties with um, the royal family in Eswatini. Here she is pictured with some of um, some royal wives in the late 1960s when she visited. She was at that point uh, Professor of Anthropology at UCLA here in California. <clears throat> and the sort of growing, and here she is with um, Sabuza, the Swazi monarch, shortly before Sabuza's death. Um, and as some of you may know, um, Hilda's kind of politics became increasingly conservative. She resisted the idea that democracy um, was an appropriate political outcome for the Swati people. She felt that monarchy was um, sort of the traditional way of doing things. She was quite hostile towards the opposition parties. And due to these political differences between them, um, that also played out through the medium of anthropology and the idea that anthropology should sort of preserve and memorialize the static traditional past, she and Regina increasingly came to be at odds with each other. Um, in the late 1960s, when Hilda visited um, Eswatini on a field trip. I only have evidence that she met with Regina once, which was at a formal lunch. She was sat next to Regina, and in a husband to her letter, a husband to her, a letter to her husband Leo, she bemoaned her poor luck at being seated next to Regina Twala, who she said was more stupid and opinionated than ever before. So clearly, a long way had. Um, a, a lot of water under the bridge had passed between the former teacher and mentor. Anyway, all to say that she refused to publish the manuscript when it was presented to her by Matsubula. Uh, when she died in the 1990s, the manuscript was folded into her personal papers, uh, and it still rests there today in the archives of the UCLA Library. So this is a page from the manuscript and then Regina's covering letter. Um, to Matt Sabula asking him to try seek publication. So in life as in, in death as in life, Regina's efforts to publish um, were once again stymied. Um, 
I'll stop share there. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to say that I'm not kind of uh, unaware of the paradoxes of the fact that, you know, yet again, Regina's legacy is in the hands of a sort of well-meaning liberal white academic. Um, and that's one of the, that's one of the tensions, one of the dynamics that my book um, deals with. You know, what, what does it mean that Regina's voice is, you know, only now coming to light through the intervention uh, of a white academic rather than on the steam of her own publishing power and her own literary reputation? What does it mean that I'm kind of rehabilitating her? Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Joelle. So um, now we will take questions. So I'd like to invite, um, I can see Atim has got a question. I, I want to invite people to ask questions. They can raise their hands by clicking the raise hand function, which is, I believe, under reactions. Or you can post your uh, question or draw um, my attention to the fact that you want to ask a question in the chat. So uh, let's go first to Atabile. Hi, I'll put my video on. Um, thank you so much, Joel. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm so glad I could make it because the class that I had just before I came here, I was talking about Lillian Chabalala and Josie Palmer. And um, all these women I keep kind of finding through the threads of the Rundle world. So my question is related to where you end off, interestingly, because it's really lovely. You paint a really beautiful and rich picture. And I've actually got two questions. And I want to preface by saying, sorry, I've written them down here. This is why I'm looking down. I want to preface by saying, um, you know, it's, I think it's important to acknowledge your positionality in relation to her. But one of the things that I'm realizing in relation to this work is that tension, but the, like the kind of paradox with also the generosity of some of this work that is coming out. And I think we need to acknowledge the tension together with this generosity. So by that, I mean, a lot of this work, um, when I find these women, um, I've used Megan Healy Clancy's work. I saw she was here earlier. I've used Dawn Curry's work. I've used Peter Lim has been amazing at helping me, um, Kim Miller. And so for me, I'm, I'm curious about, first of all, what is it about the global north, I mean, we know, but I just, I, I think I'd like you to make it more explicit, being, having access to this information that we, the people in the global south, don't have access to this information. That's the first question. And then if you could just speak to, I mean, you kind of mentioned Tim Cousins and having access to that, um, to his, um, the, his papers, but what was your archival process? So did you have to kind of do a patchwork or did you kind of find um, chunks of information. I'm just curious because I'm kind of trying to follow in some of these threads and I'm finding it incredibly difficult to access some of this. Is it networks that I'm perhaps not privy to? What is happening? Because I'm finding a lot of this scholarship, which is wonderful scholarship and it's really rich, really coming from, I mean, Robert Edgar just wrote the book about Josie Palmer. So I could name names um, and what's that dynamic about? Thanks. Thanks, um, Atembila, for those two, two really rich questions. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the first thing about kind of why so much of this um, is in the global north and kind of how that's affected my research process. I mean, one of my starting points <clears throat> was the fact that Regina Twala's sole um, surviving manuscript, and, you know, I think she may have written as many as six. I have definite evidence of at least two, the novel and then the ethnographic manuscript that Hilda Cooper has. Um, but certainly in, in her extensive correspondence with Dan Twala over the years, she spoke about several other manuscripts in progress. Um, so why is it that the sole surviving manuscript of Regina Twala is languishing, you know, unread and untouched, I think, until I saw it just a few years ago in the papers of a white academic who died in LA and whose intellectual legacy has been kind of folded up into the university collection. You know, why, why is this kind of precious historical resource there um, and, and not where I believe it should be, which is freely accessible, not only to Regina Twala's family, but also to readers, readers in Southern Africa. Um, you know, there is a, a sort of literary activist element um, to my research and that actually the way in which this project, this biography started, um, was my effort to try and publish Regina's manuscript as a sort of standalone book in its own right. 
The publisher who I approached told me that, you know, as an entirely unknown writer, um, there would just be no traction for this as a standalone book. And the publisher's advice was to actually first try and write her biography. And then when she sort of gets some traction and name, then revisit this idea of publishing, publishing her book. Uh, you know, I should add that this is a, a North American publisher. So, I mean, that that is obviously what I've done. Here I am writing her biography. But, you know, as I absolutely understood the publisher's perspective, but it seemed to me to be a sort of tragic microcosm of the kinds of issues that I'm exploring in this book, that Regina's writing in her own voice, in her own right as a literary figure, standing by herself was not deemed significant enough and that it was my sort of mediating interpretation as, as an established white academic at a prestigious university in the global north that was seen a more fitting platform to bring Regina's voice um, to a wider public. So, you know, those, those are the sort of tensions that I, th I think not only play, are playing out now in my efforts to kind of publish Regina, but also during her own lifetime in her efforts to publish herself. So I, you know, I don't know if that's answered your question, but it's, you know, it's it's very um, it's very tangled and problematic. With regard to my own archival process, um, so I think the sort of starting point for this project and, and the really fabulous thing about um, writing about Regina Twala is that between her and Dan Twala, there were nearly one thousand letters exchanged over a thirty-year period um, when they met in the mid-thirties until her death in nineteen sixty-eight. And these, thanks to the meticulous archiving of her husband, Dan Twala, have been preserved. And then, as I mentioned, in the late 1970s, he lent them um, to Tim Cousins to work on. Uh, one of the things that I am working on now with, with the family is having these letters archived uh, at Witt's historical papers, which seems a fitting place due to the fact that um, Regina was a Witt's graduate. Um, COVID and it sort of inability to travel, the closure of historical papers for a long time last year has sort of slowed down the whole process. But the aim is absolutely to make this fantastic trove of historical material um, available and accessible to researchers um, in Southern Africa. So I could I could say, you know, I could say many more things about the archiving side of it, but um, I see that there are more hands, so maybe I'll stop there. But Atamila, please do email me because I'd, I'd love to be in touch with you and we could continue the conversation uh, after this. Thanks, Joel. Uh, can I ask people to mute their mics, please? I'm giving some background noise. All right, so I've got a nice list building up here. I have, uh, let me just read it out so you know. Vusi, Suzanne, Safiso, Debbie, Nafisa, Bochotlo, and I'm waiting for others too. Uh, so let's go with uh, Vusi first. Okay, uh, th thanks uh, Joel for this fascinating uh, paper. Um, um, while I was reading your paper, I was trying to actually draw the parallel between the project that I'm currently doing with Benjamin Lawrence on Doug Mopudi, uh, of which we've just produced a paper and we edited his book, um, a paper that will come out in the American Historical Review uh, this coming June. Um, the reason why I was drawing the parallel is that um, which raises the question on how did the manuscript that you actually uncovered in California inspired you to embark on this, pro on this project? The reason why it's because we also came across a letter uh, in the Africa Peru collection in Oxford that uh, inspired us to actually write a biography which we are busy writing on, on Doug Mopudi. So it, 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 I see it as becoming a trend among scholars who uncover uh, these uh, archival resources that are, as you are saying, are languishing in, in, in these uh, international archives to, to start writing about these people. So may you please tell us more about that. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Rusi. And um, yeah, I've been following uh, your and Ben Lawrence's work on Doug Mobuti, and um, I'm really excited about reading the article you mentioned. Um, 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I think this actually links to Atanvila's point as well, which is that, you know, many of these unknown literary gems are in kind of global north archives. So, you know, obviously Regina's manuscript is in UCLA. Her work for Sunkla is in his papers in Uppsala in Sweden. Um, and, you know, I, th I think there is a lot of, um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in kind of uncovering a whole realm of literary production that sort of exists outside of the mainstream. I mean, we really have to credit, you know, people like Karen Barber and others, Derek Peterson, for sort of stimulating this interest in what we could call tin, tin trunk literacy. Um, I mean, I, I think the thing that interests me is, is the sort of um, kind of unpublished status of a lot of this work. You know, the, the fact that how do you tell a literary history of Southern Africa that, you know, tries to sidestep this issue of who was published and who was not, because I think publication was such a fraught and loaded phenomenon, so tied up with privilege and inequity and access to publishing networks and gatekeeping. How do you tell a history of literary production without sort of, you know, venerating the fetish of publication? Um, and it's logistically very, very difficult because by definition, work that isn't published is really hard to track down. It exists in archives and personal papers. I think most of the time it hasn't been preserved. And then just kind of a, a final point um, to what you're saying, Lucy. I, you know, I think what I'm so interested about um, with her work with Sunkla is the fact that in that case, her published work was preserved, but it was preserved under the wrong name. It was passed off as the work of someone else. And I think there must be so many um, similar examples of research assistants in African countries providing intellectual labor for academics coming from Europe or North America, and then whose work is kind of seamlessly appropriated and assimilated into the output of the sort of formal academic. And, you know, we talk a lot about decolonizing the curriculum and introducing more African authors into canons and to reading lists. What if the African authors were there all along? What if they are living in the published work of white scholars, but unacknowledged and unnamed? What does decolonizing the canon look like from that perspective of seeking more just attribution mechanisms for the thousands of research assistants whose army of work over the years has undergirded um, classics of African studies. So um, we have a queue. It's, it's good that there's an hour, an entire field actually, I think emerging in, in, in this work. So I've got Suzanne next. Right. Morning, Joel. Thank you very much for your paper. Uh, yeah, riveting. Um, like Atembile, it was your very last comment that I was responding to. You said, what does it mean that it's you, a, a white woman in the global north, the bringing, shedding, bringing light to, to her work? And um, I, Atembile phrased it much more articulately. But before I elaborate on that thought, I want to just step back and you say the question is, you know, who was published and who was not is an interesting question for you. But it isn't just that, I don't think. I, I've been working for the last couple of years on a biography of uh, Juby Mayat, who wrote for 20 plus years for Drum and Golden City Post, very widely published and yet hidden in plain sight, not remembered in, in the canon, you know, of Drum and so on. And, um, you know, her memoir is coming out in a few months, published by Jacana. Again, but that's what I, getting back to my original question that Etimbile raised, you know, what does it mean that it's it's someone like you and like me, I would say, you know, I work in North America, um, maybe where it's a similar age, um, training in the global north. In my case, Juby's, everything's local. She lived in Lanasia. So my only logistical issue was getting to Lanasia, um, but getting first to South Africa. So, um, yeah, so first of all, it isn't just women, of black women who were not published. I think this also applies to published black women being forgotten. But I would like to hear you talk more about it because I feel like I'm personally invested in hearing more of your, your thoughts on what does it mean that it's someone like you um, doing this work. So in the interest of time, Joelle, I'm going to take a bunch of questions here so that um, okay. you don't get too backed up. Uh, so next was Safiso. Safiso, would you like me to, to uh, I think it'd be nice if you asked your question rather than me read it out. 
This is Saviso Sabella. There was more than one Saviso in this call. Uh, I'm wait. Is that you, Saviso? He has audio issues, he says. Okay, quickly, let me just read what he said and scroll up and find it. What is the role of the researcher in ensuring that stories similar to, to these are not relegated to sidelines of history, particularly in the Af African context where voices are intentionally silenced? So it's a version of, the, of what we've been discussing. Um, Debbie? Sorry, <laughs> got the tech right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joel. That was fascinating. Uh, of course, for me, as someone who worked on interwar Johannesburg and that whole missionary liberal complex, it was absolutely wonderful to see people in Wayfarer uniform and hearing about how she goes to the Jan Hofmeyer school. I don't know whether she overlapped with Winnie Mandela or not, because Winnie also goes there. But it's fascinating that her trajectory is so long and takes you into the 1960s and Ghana and Pan-Africanism. So that's a very fascinating aspect. But I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the bad missionary researcher. I wanted to talk a bit about Suntla because it's obviously incredibly disappointing to discover the close, um, parallel, well, the, the lifting of these paragraphs and absolutely no acknowledgement of her. She was dead by then. I see from your um, dates that she had died in 1968. So when the book comes out in 76, she's not even around to know that her uh, labor is not being acknowledged. Um, but I wondered quite hard whether you can tell how much how much more he uses her than he uses the men that he does acknowledge i just think that's interesting i don't know whether the men that he acknowledges are in his papers as well but that makes the task too big for you to sort of expect that you've got to to weigh them up but i mean i think the whole thing of the research assistant's role is absolutely crucial. And, you know, there's been a lot of interest in that, in, you know, people writing about Monica Wilson. I tried to do it a little bit myself in a piece I wrote about Dora Earthy, the woman missionary in Mozambique, who publishes a book in 1934 called Valengi Women. And I kind of went back to it and tried to see, okay, what do Rhoda and Mara tell her? What, what do they open up to her? Um, so I think it's absolutely crucial, this whole issue, and uh, obviously one wants um, Twala to be, to be acknowledged. I haven't had a chance to look at my thesis notes, but I'm sure she writes something published in a Joburg newspaper in the 1930s about domestic servants. Yeah, so I was just interested in all of that. But... Yeah, I'm just raising the issue of the missionary misuse of her, unacknowledgement un un of her work. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, let's take one more for this round, uh, Nafisa, and then I've got a new round already lined up. Okay, uh, sorry, I didn't expect you to come up on me uh, quite so quickly. Um, unfortunately, you know, I'm of you know, I don't know if, if having me in this round, same round of questions is not um, somewhat dragging it in another direction. Um, but I suppose um, that what I have to say is really quite different. Uh, Joel, when you present right up front and also in your abstract, um, you talk about the main argument of the book being about this kind of uh, sort of the conspiracy to keep her unpublished. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, for me, it's a little in, strange because it seems like a logically secondary argument to why she is interesting in and of herself. And 
I'm wondering how the setting up of those questions is really about a biography of the subject of Galana Twala versus a kind of, you know, a, a form, another form of, as you said, a kind of literary activism. So that for me is kind of important because, um, I mean, I suppose, you know, what I, what I would say really is that, you know, the, the, some of these questions um, like, um, you know, the recovery, for example, um, of, of black female intellectuals is something that's been going on for a little while. It's not, you know, explosively new. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of, of Charlotte McTecker, for example. I mean, so Zubeda Jaffer's new book, 2019 book, is trying to grapple with why it's so blurry. I mean, David Gerber wrote about her in 1973. Julia Walls wrote about her in 1983. The problem is, you know, really publishing their, her own work as opposed to the work of the activist, uh, scholar or whatever, just strikes me as a, a, a sort of more, well, I don't know, just for me a more interesting problem. But um, I'm also interested in um, basically how it is that some of the, um, her narrative seems to get lost in the way these two chapters are set up. Um, because it's very clear in the beginning that she's obsessed with questions of gender and she comes back to this in her politics at the end, but it sort of disappears in the middle when uh, she is talking about Zionism as this kind of uh, African traditionalist thing. So her gender politics becomes invisible, except that she really seems to be very close to the queen mother. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering what work she's trying to do, gen it, you know, what work she's trying to do with trying to understand the relationship between gender and traditionalism. It's something that sort of, um, I imagine, sort of falls out. I'm also interested in a number of the quotes in the, in the piece um, that I think, you know, could, could do so much more work and her concern about dated work. Um, in the evidence she gives in the court case towards the end of the paper, because um, it's, you know, all of us who've ever worried about the relevance of our writing um, are sometimes thankful we haven't published things sooner. And I'm interested in the fact, for example, that, um, you know, there are things she clearly tried to publish that were blocked. And there seem to be things that she declared unpublished, but, you know, we're not sure what the sort of fights over those things were. So yeah, I mean, that's like, you know, lots of questions, but I suppose I'm, I just find her own work that whenever you sort of the quotes are drawn out so unbelievably compelling that uh, I'm just wondering why they and sort of hers are a very complicated biological, sorry, biographical subject is not the center actually of these pieces. I mean, for one, for one reason, I just say that us grappling in South Africa, for example, with the ventriloquizing of black voices is something that's been around since the seed is mine. And that's a good 30 years now. So I'm, you know, and I'm also thinking of Lynn Thomas's piece about agency. There's so much stuff going through my head. All right. I haven't Thanks, to, uh, to question, but those are it. <laughs> I'm going to use my, my uh, seminar uh, chairing uh, prerogative to actually keep you quiet for once. Um, I wish I could do that more generally, jokes. Uh, so uh, Joelle, there's a lot of questions, and um, I, I just before you dive into this round, I did want to just add that Nick Sadi said in the chat that he thinks that you should think about the historical publications of South Africa as a possible outlet. That's the artist formerly known as the Van Riebeek Society as an outlet for this work because they publish lots of this kind of stuff, as you, as, as you know. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm just making a note of that sort of um thank you so much uh suzanne Sifiso, debbie and nafisa for those um extremely rich questions i don't think i can do justice to all of them but let me i mean i'll try to speak to each one of you but i don't think i can cover everything so um suzanne first of all i'd love if you can put in the chat the name of your forthcoming biography with jacana because um that sounds really exciting and i should definitely check that out i mean i suppose really the first two questions were kind of more around the racial politics of this kind of um, this kind of work um, and Suzanne you sort of invited me to talk more about my my positionality in it I mean I suppose in this sense it's probably um, relevant to say that you know I, I myself 
um, I'm of sort of white Southern African ancestry that I grew up in Eswatini, um, that my family are there. And that I, I, you know, these are issues that I address in the introduction and that I was very much part of this sort of white settler complicity with Swazi neo-traditionalism. You know, the fact that the white community in Eswatini has a relatively peaceful and untroubled life is because they've sort of assented to the status quo and they have, you know, more or less bought the idea that traditional customary monarchy is the, the natural state of affairs for the Swati people and they don't kind of support pro-democracy um, change. They sort of put their head down and go about their business. So, you know, kind of writing about Regina's increasing revulsion towards white liberals and white liberals in Eswatini in the 50s and 60s became a kind of particularly pointed um, target of her ire. Um, I think, you know, these are kind of complex personal questions for me as well about what it means to be part of a white settler community in Southern Africa and, you know, our, our own kind of questions of complicity and personal responsibility. So that's just kind of, you know, an autobiographical note on this. Um, and I think sort of maybe speaking more to the second question around, um, Stephen, you read this out, so I hope I got it, but sort of around voices and silencing and listening to people. You know, one of the sort of startling discoveries is when I approached the UCLA archives and said that I wanted to publish this manuscript. This is when I was still looking for a publisher for it. Um, they actually said to me that um, I, I couldn't, that I said that the family wanted to publish it. And they said, well, the family don't own this manuscript. This is part of Hilda Cooper's paper. So the copyright rests with her um, and then with her estate. So this sort of immediately plunged me not only into the whole question around politics of publication, but also sort of politics of copyright and estate and inheritance. And as some of you know here, this is something that I've been trying to untangle with uh, Twala for some months now. But just the issue of kind of who, who owns her work, who, who gets to publish her, who, who sort of speaks for her estate, um, who's kind of appropriated her copyright. Um, I think is, is very relevant um, to all of these questions. And then D Debbie, around sort of research assistance and sort of missionary appropriation and stuff, you know, I think it is disappointing. Um, the only thing I would say about research assistance is that this isn't something we can kind of safely consign to, um, you know, misogynistic missionaries of the 1950s. Um, you know, the the sort of industry of research assistance is well, well and thriving. I mean, I imagine that very many people on this call, certainly I myself have extensively used research assistance in my own work. Um, and I think, you know, regardless of how responsibly or not we address issues of attribution and acknowledgement, I think these kind of ethical complexities are always there. And that at the end of the day, it's one person's name who rests on the title page and it's one page who gets the sort of research attribution and kudos for the publication. So I think it sort of points to a much murkier world of intellectual labor in the creation of African studies um, and a sort of vast, vast world of unacknowledged labor that I think is just as pertinent today as it was in the 1950s. Um, and we might be more careful than simpler was, you know, we might acknowledge, we might not plagiarize, but is the fundamental dynamic really so different um, would, would be kind of my concern. And, you know, this is something I'm, I'm asking as much of myself as, as anyone here in this room who's engaged in those kinds of relationships. Um, and then finally, Nafisa, thanks so much for those um, really rich questions. I, I mean, I think, I think I hear what you're saying is, uh, she she is more interesting than you. You know, your kind of angst about being a white woman writing the biography of a black woman um, shouldn't shouldn't dominate, shouldn't take center stage. That you know, ultimately, Regina Twal and her life in and of its own right is is the real story here, not your kind of guilty feelings about being a white woman and doing that work. Um, and you know, to that, I I absolutely agree. Um, you know, I think she should be center stage. I think she should be the focus, not me and my sort of conflicted feelings about all of this. Um, I guess my, my sort of sense would be, 
you know, part of the problem with this excerpt is it's just two chapters and the, the whole book is about 17 or 18 chapters. So unlike a paper, which is a sort of complete thing in and of its own right, probably a lot of it, and you know, also these issues about gender that you mentioned um, kind of come out better when read as a whole. But, you know, Nafisa, I absolutely take, take your point. Um, you know, this shouldn't be kind of another angsty exercise on the part of a white academic. Um, and, you know, as we've been discussing before, efforts to publish her work, um, including efforts to get Oxford University Press, the publisher of Simpler's book um, that used her unattributed work, getting Oxford University Press to, to revisit the issue of copyright and attribution of authorship in that publication, which is a process I'm starting now. Um, you know, I think those, those tasks really um, are, are center stage and, as you say, much more important and interesting. But thanks, thanks for that. All right, so we have a remaining uh, uh, round. And uh, let's see, so Bechutlo, uh, do you want to ask your question, Bechutlo, or shall I read it out? Um, Please read it out. Okay, so I, I'm just checking you didn't have two separate comments. <laughs> the problem with there's, you know, one of the problems of Zoom is this scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, I think that I think the main body of your question is at the bottom. So I'm just going back down. I uh, said, so it's a great paper. I love, um, I really enjoyed it. I would like to comment the fact that Gelena's voice was trusted by Sunkla as he parts of his own shows, which shows that even though she was excluded, um, her input was clearly considered to be useful and important. I feel like Sandler did indirectly acknowledge her voice by passing the research information on. This is, this is an interesting and original argument, actually. But obviously, plagiarism is a no-no and unethical. Um, so um, you can add that to, 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 to the mix. Um, Peter Lim. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, work and talk, uh, Joel. Thank you very much for that. My question really revolves around the last uh, decade of her life. And um, in the last few pages, you talk about her political activism. I wonder if you have can say a little bit more about uh, the texture of this. And did she also suffer any kind of marginalization from the leaders of the NNLC or SPP, I mean, Zwane and others, you notice how many votes she got. And I also wondered about the last three years after she retires from public uh, activity, whether, and, and whether there were any interviews you gleaned uh, about her activity in politics. You, you cite two interviews in that, uh, on that last page or two, uh, but they don't seem to talk to events of the 60s so much. Natasha? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, just apologies in advance since I put my hand up, I've forgotten my question about three times, which means I've come up with three times as many questions, I'm afraid. Um, I wanted to ask you something which is more along the lines of um, perhaps a more conventional biographical approach, Joel. I mean, it sounds like Regina was actually quite grumpy at points in time. Um, and, I, and I wondered what your take, uh, you know, was she a difficult person to get along with? Um, because that's something that comes through to me from what you've said and what I've read in what you've written. Um, and of course, we can't always put what we think um, in our academic pieces, but I'd just be interested um, to think a bit more about that. Um, and then the second point that I wanted to make um, is, uh, and it's along the lines of the comment just made um, uh, about um, the fact that maybe in fact, Sunkla was uh, acknowledging um, Regina's work because of his inclusion of it, and which is, it, it's rather about um, different ideas around publication. Um, 
And is there a way in which we should be consider, considering publication and perhaps the sharing of text and information um, in more ephemeral ways um, than, than via the written word, which always has appeared to me to be um, uh, not um, of its own nature and in South Africa, um, not of its own nature and outside of South Africa, particularly masculine, but in South Africa, it seems to be a particularly masculine affair. And then the last thing that I wanted to say is actually just a comment, which is that, um, you know, there's, there's someone whose work many of us here in this forum today will have used as sort of an eminent, um, uh, one or two eminent scholars in the Eastern Cape, um, who, um, you know, it transpires from a kind of a, I don't know, perhaps the best and most charitable uh, uh, take on this is to say that, um, coming from very homosocial environments, um, they systematically um, erased uh, women's voices from, from, from written work in ways that were probably at the time fairly conscious, but I don't think, I mean, you've suggested that what you're talking about is fairly widespread and it's widespread, not just within the format of, 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 of published writing, but in other genres as well. Thanks everyone. And it just, hello, there's some lovely people online today, um, and I just want to give a hello um, to all my lovely colleagues out there from far and wide. Thank you. All right, Lucy. Yes, hello. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I actually just asked you to read it for me, but I will uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, I'm working for my PhD um, on women's writing through the Black Consciousness era. And um, I was wondering if when you were reading through the Bantu world and um, the times in, in you know, Swaziland, have you come across any other uh, female writers that um, were, were present in, in the newspapers or even male writers that, you know, posed as female, you know, that had female voices. Um, um, and, and was there any, in terms of the literary activism, was there any sort of collective writing about um, challenging the patriarchy or those gender, you know, norms and, and the making of um, Black modern identity, so through the 30s, right up to when she was in Swaziland, because um, I find that, you know, even with writing in drum magazine and, and the likes, um, men or male voices direct sort of the public discourse um, around what's feminine ideal and, and you know, so I'm wondering if you, you did have a look at that or come across any sort of collective or just um, with the women themselves, or even the men showing up as, as, as women in, in these newspapers. Thank you. So, um, I, I just Joelle, I think you probably noticed there, that the chat today has been really flowing. Um, so yeah. there are lots of comments, maybe more than questions. Some people are answering other people's questions, it's, so it's really excellent. Um, I did want to tack my question on at the end of, of Busi's, which is about, again, the newspaper column. Uh, it looks as though, at least in the chapters that you gave us, she managed to hold on to her column in the Times at least uh, past the point at which she was doing the more stereotypical anthropological portraits. And I suppose the question is, why is that if, as you suggest, it was a kind of conceit of the editor that, that, that you know, it looked good uh, to, to have a, a black author on the books, do you, a writer on the books, do you, can you offer us a, a sort of more detailed explanation for why she seemed to be able to hold on to it for a while? Hmm. Thank you so much for another great round of questions. Um, I'll do I'll do my best with them. Um, so first, um, Bo Kutlo, who asked about um, simpler sort of uh, implicitly recognizing the, the value of her work by plagiarizing her. I mean, I absolutely agree. I think Sinclair probably couldn't believe his luck in finding such uh, a talented and um, intelligent research assistant. 
I mean, I, I, I kind of indirectly have experienced this because when I was writing my book on Zionism, I extensively used Simpler's work, um, not realizing that in using Simpler's work, I was actually using Regina's work, certainly for this chapter on Eswatini. So um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it says, speaks volumes to the quality of her ethnography that, that Sunkler was so, um, uh, you know, so quick to pass off, off, off her work as his own. And I think also, this is also speaking not only to the politics of publishing, but also to the politics of academic appointments, because, you know, why was it not, you know, Regina in another world who was writing her academic monograph to be published by Oxford University Press? And why was she not the one who was um, sort of employing a research assistant to do work for her and with her? Um, so kind of, yeah, the, the hierarchies of academic appointments, I think, as well, also come up here. Um, Peter, thanks, thanks for your for your comments. Um, so with regard to her last few years, when she quit politics um, after the, the referendum in the 60s, she lived for another four years or so. And then I mentioned she died of um, she died of cancer uh, in 1968. So um, sort of prematurely, pr prematurely dead at around the age of 60. For those last few years, she turned again to social work. Um, so it was in this period that Aswatini was preparing for independence, that it was trying to quote unquote, Africanize the civil service. So there was um, a lot of attention in identifying um, Emma Swati individuals to fulfill key administrative roles um, in government. And a new department of social welfare was started in preparation for independence. And she was actually appointed as the secretary of this new um, department. And, you know, all indications are that she was sort of positioned to be the Tsar of, of social work in independent Eswatini um, had she not died. Although, you know, the question, of course, is her, you know, her, her bad politics and her increasing alienation from Sibuza and from the traditionalist project which those of you who know your Eswatini history know that, you know, after independence it only got worse. In the early 70s, Sabuza suspended the constitution, banned political parties. So my sense is that the 60s were really a sort of um, flowering of democratic expression in Eswatini of a light that hasn't been seen since then for the last 50 years. That from the early 1970s, things got a lot worse and that's more or less persisted to this day. So in the 1960s, there was at one point five, even six different political parties. The newspapers, both Israel and Maswazi, which seized in the, you know, after independence or shortly before independence and the times of Swaziland and a number of sort of more ephemeral publications put out by all of these political parties. That there was just this very, very lively public sphere of debate and contestation that I think got shut down um, quite severely uh, from the 70s onwards. Um, insofar as sort of gendered fallings up between her and key leadership in the NNLC, I, I know that she was always on very friendly terms with Amber Zwane up until her death. I know that she, she had some conflicts with John Nuru, who was the leader of SPP, who was himself fairly misogynistic in his views. Um, John Nuru, and I think this maybe addresses um, Busi's question about sort of newspaper writers, Although he, John Lowell was a man, a sort of towering figure in nationalist politics in the country, uh, he wrote as a columnist for many years for Israel Amaswazi, um, and sort of his, his main meat as a columnist was taking pot shots at women for wearing mini skirts in the 60s and makeup and so on. So, you know, this was who led um, one of the main opposition parties, and, and Regina certainly struggled with him. And, and just before I move on to the next question, part of the problem with reconstructing this period um, of Swati politics in the 1960s is just the paucity of sources. So in the, in the National Archives in November, there is almost nothing on the opposition parties, which I can only you know, put down to politics and the fact that these records have either not been preserved or perhaps have been preserved somewhere else, safe from the prying eyes of researchers. Um, a couple of sort of Commonwealth Institute collections in London and at SOAS have, have some material on the parties, but it's very confined to the one, two or three men who sat at the very upper strata of leadership. So people like Regina, who was secretary of the Women's League, um, dealing with women's activities, tended to be almost completely obscured in those kinds of official correspondences. So really the, the only 
kind of place where you can go to for a more kind of grassroots textured account of politics as well as interviews, but it, it is difficult because a, a lot of people are no longer alive and B, a lot of people are very, very reluctant to talk about their political involvement in the 1960s um, and have since sw swapped allegiance. So, you know, one of the things I talk about in this chapter is how the nationalist leadership was effectively co-opted by Sabuza from the late 60s onwards and sort of brought into the royalist kraal. So a lot of people just don't want to talk about the fact that they were in the NLC in the 1960s if they are still alive. So it's, it's a very difficult period um, to reconstruct, mm -hmm. I find, although I'd love to hear, you know, from others who've worked on this. Um, Natasha, she was very grumpy. She was a very bad-tempered, difficult person. And almost everyone who I've interviewed has this to say about her, including her daughter-in-law, who nursed her almost to her death. She said, you know, my mother-in-law was moody, like you had to be really careful around that woman. And, you know, again, I think sort of moodiness and grumpiness are quite sort of feminized um, categories. And I feel there's generations of women, and maybe we can think of our own mothers too in this category, who were stymied, frustrated, blocked professionally. Um, and, you know, for Regina, it was not only blocked on account of her gender, but blocked on account of her race. She had two failed marriages. Both had failed largely due to um, infidelity on the husband's part. Her marriage also failed because Dan took exception to her political activities. He didn't like the fact that, you know, he had gained a wife who really just didn't want to be at home. He accused her of not being a good mother, not taking care of the son, being more interested in her career and traveling around and activism and writing and politics. So it's like the world, the world wasn't ready for her. And, you know, that's enough to make anyone grumpy. Um, and, you know, in the book as a whole, I do try to sort of give some texture of her personality. And, and as I mentioned, these amazing letters that she um, she swapped with Dan Twala over 30 years, they're incredibly intimate, um, very, very personal, heartfelt, um, frequently very sexual letters. So this kind of more personal side of her does come out um, more, I hope, in some other chapters. Um, and Tasha, I'm intrigued what you said about... Um, thinking about attribution and collaboration and sort of intellectual property in ways that exceed merely publishing and the written word. And I'd love to talk um, to you more about that at some time. Um, and then the last two questions, Busi, so great question about um, sort of women's writing and intentional efforts to mobilize around sort of gendered solidarities in the space of newspapers. So the person who's done a lot of work on this, who you may know is Corrine Sandwith, and her, her work, particularly on Bantu World in the 1930s, has really shown that there was this kind of um, flowering of female authorship in newspapers in the 1930s, that for some reason by the 40s and the 50s had, had sort of disappeared. You know, when we think of the sort of literary, literary luminaries of drum, uh, you know, can timber and so like these, these are mainly men. It's very hard to think of any kind of famous, glamorous um, women writers in that kind of literary clique of the 1950s that was centered around drum and other publications. So it does seem to me, as with Eswatini, the 60s were more progressive than now, as with South African newspapers, the 30s seem to be more progressive than um, future generations. Um, and yeah, there was a very definite sense of, of women having to mobilize to make themselves heard and the phenomenon of, you know, newspapers being dominated by men. And when there were women writers, sometimes these were men posing as women, as Corinne Sandwith has documented. So women, including Regina, got very riled at this and felt that it was, it was really important to push back and put forward a female presence um, in newspapers. Um, and then... Uh, Oh, and actually, sorry, just thinking about drum, she was the first women's editor for drum. She only wrote for them for about a year or two, 52, 53, I think. But she is listed there um, as editor for women's affairs. And she ran um, a sort of children's corner column and sort of self-help tips um, for, for women. And then um, finally, uh, Stephen, and I saw something in the chat, I think from Hugh McMillan um, about Will Talbot. So Will Talbot was the editor of the Times of Swaziland. Hugh probably knows more, well, I'm sure he knows more about him than I do. And I think he said he was kind of a famous white liberal. I mean, my sense is that Will Talbot um, didn't really, I mean, I have no evidence. I mean, I have no correspondence between them, but I 
you know, judging from the fact that she continued to write, even when her columns took this kind of more, more radical politically um, turn, as well as more innovative and experimental with ideas of tradition and Swazi custom. I imagine he didn't really mind. I mean, her political criticisms were made in incredibly veiled ways. Um, so, so one of her columns after the referendum basically accused Sabuza and the Royalists of rigging the referendum. So, you know, of course, Sabuza would win. But she didn't come out and say that. She said it in very oblique, sort of sideways, slanted, metaphorical ways. So she was careful. You know, even though she was using these columns as a platform for critique of the monarchy, she was doing it in, in fairly careful ways. And then after the election of 64 and her defeat and her resignation from politics, she still wrote very, very actively, but her columns much more explicitly focused on social work, um, which I don't think should be seen necessarily as a retreat from the political, just a redefinition of what the obligations of the state were to its most vulnerable members of society, um, women, children, and, and widows. Thanks so much, Atamila. Um, yeah. Great to see you. Thanks, thanks Joelle and everyone. Uh, we, uh, Vusi did also add one last quest question. What I'll do is I will send the chat to Joelle, which you can- Please do, yeah. Yeah, and obviously it was recorded as well. I'd like to just thank everyone for their, taking their time. Um, and uh, thank you, Joelle, for your early rise. Uh, as you can see, the questions are still coming. Um, Hugh McMillan says that the editor in question was enlightened and generous. He would have tried to support her intellectually and financially. And, um, and it's it, there's, not there's, still, there's still more. I am, however, going to have to say, I saw the bow ask something. I'm going to have to put uh, uh, an end to this just because otherwise the file is going to be ridiculously big. Um, yes, Stephen, <laughs> please, please I do. I will send, yeah, send I just want to reassure chat. everyone, yeah. I will send your okay. comment to Joel. okay? And the video will be on YouTube as well. Thank you, everyone, very much for Thanks joining us. Thanks so much. This was and, so enjoyable. Thank uh, you. Yeah, we'll, we'll see hopefully many of you next time. Take care. Stay safe.